I knew that you had something to do with this education or getting hired to do something. I knew that you had something going on. I didn't know exactly what. meeting we got to conduct. All right, so uh, first, thank you all for coming today. Happy New Year. Um, this will be our 2019 annual business meeting, and I'm going to declare it in session. Uh, last year was a very good year. We had a lot of good programs. I want to thank both our presenters as well as you members uh, coming out and making us uh, grow for another year. Um, So this time I'd like to have the 2018 Board of Directors stand up and be recognized. If you all would stand up, you as well. Just thank you all for your service. All right, so for the Treasurer's Report, uh, members got a ballot of sorts. All I just need you to do near the end is just to hold it up as I ask for a vote. Uh, does anybody have any questions on the budget of 2019? So this year, last year we started off with in our general account of $2,340.07. We ended up at $1,244, uh, which is a great time to mention membership. If you guys haven't renewed your membership, please do. That's where the majority of our funds come from. Uh, our Kellisburgers Fund. Uh, started the year at $4,207.89 and we ended up at $4,209.16 because of interest. So for now what I'd like to do is have the members vote mm -hmm. on the budget. I have a question. Absolutely. What is this office space that's being paid for? Sure, all right, so the office space is in Melbourne, and because we do things like uh, the Inspiring Memory Program with the Alzheimer's Association, uh, we're putting together trunks for school, for classrooms, we needed a place, and where we keep our collection right now is a storage unit, and because of it's not very well ventilated, anybody with any kind of lung issues or allergies, you can only work there for about a half an hour. So we needed a place that we could work for like an hour or three hours and get uh, either pamphlets done, programs, instruction manuals. So that's where we got the office. And Sutton Properties has given us a very good uh, rental rate for the for the office we have. So we are using it every month and it's a good, good use. So can you tell us where it is? Yeah, it's on Prospect Place. So if you go up to US1, it's on Prospect Ave, it's the Prospect Building. It's on the north side of Prospect Ave. We're on the second floor, unit 203, if I'm correct. You see a sign of us, yeah. It's not always manned. If you call my numbers on the website, you're more than happy to meet you up there if you have any other questions or want to see what we're doing up there. It is, a, you know, if you call us, our members can definitely come up and we can talk. Any other questions? So at this time, I would like to have a motion to approve the 2019 budget. Carol? Okay. Do I have a second? Second. All right. Uh, any questions on the budget? Uh, if hearing none other, uh, all in favor of the motion to approve the 2019 budget, uh, please raise your. Anybody not in favor of it? All right. So the motion passes. Thank you. All right. For the election of the officers, um, first I'd like to extend a, a thank you to Sue Bailey. Well, who's in the front there, you met her as you came in. Uh, Diane Newman and Jimmy Cox, which is over there, who put together this slate of uh, proposed uh, board members and board of directors for this year. Um, is there any other nominees? Does anybody have? 
Any questions or anything? Any other nominations besides what's on this list? Okay, so hearing that, I will declare the slate of nominees elected by acclamation. This is something else. So, are there any other items before we move on to our program that any member would like to ask? And feel free to ask me or any of the board of directors after this. That's great. All right, thank you all. All right, so now I'd like to introduce uh, Bob Freeman and our one of our directors, uh, Jim Polis, and they're going to speak about uh, the history of surfing and the legends uh, that lived here. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Jim and Bob. Thank you. Everybody hear me? Yeah. Good. Okay, first of all, I want to make something perfectly clear. I'm Jim Polis. I'm just the old local surfer. Bob is the local legend. Okay. <laughs> uh, a little bit of family history. Uh, my family and I moved down here in 1956. Uh, we moved to an uh, oceanfront. It was an old efficiency motel called Sea Island Manor, and we grew up on the beach. Uh, when we left Chicago in 1956, we were kind of disowned by the rest of the family, who uh, uh, thought we were crazy for moving to uh, you know, no man's land, a mosquito-infested place like Florida. So every year we had a Christmas card like this one here. <laughs> when they were buried in the snow, we were lined up on the beach down there. And our first one was 1956, and my sister Stacy, which is the, 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 the youngest one on, on, on there, she was uh, less than a year old when we first moved down here, but she was in that picture on the beach when we first came down here. Uh, my brother Thanis and I started surfing around 1962. Uh, we weren't sure that we'd take the surfing, we didn't have money for a surfboard, so we bought a couple of blanks, uh, like over on the left-hand side there, and we just put a fin on them and fiberglass them. We didn't know anything about shaping or anything, so these things were real tanks up in the water. But they, they served a purpose to kind of get us hooked on surfing, and then we, uh, a year later, bought all our boards, and on the right, that was my first board. That was a Hanson Doyle model, about a nine foot. My brother Thanis had a uh, Hobie Step Down, my brother Lou had a surfboard Hawaii, uh, the board behind my dad was the Gordon Smith, and the one behind my mom was uh, what the one we made. And the little one behind my uh, sister, Stacy, belonged to this one. I caught, I, I caught my cat how to surf. And a, a little history of stupid, okay? Why he was named stupid. Uh, when we first moved down here, my grandparents had, had bought one kitten for each of, the, uh, each, each of the family, each of the kids in the family. So we had five kittens. And uh, of course, back then, nobody spayed or neutered cats, so pretty soon we, we had a dozen, and then we had like two dozen. But stupid, you know, cats and kittens are typically coordinated, they're, they're typically uh, uh, very light on their feet, nimble. Stupid was a klutz. Stupid would trip over his own feet when he would run. He would, uh, he would constantly knock stuff over. When he went to get a drink of water, he'd do a face plant in the water bowl. And then he'd run away and he'd have to sneak up on the water bowl to kind of get a drink out of it. So, uh, so he got the name of Stupid. But when we would go down on the beach with our fishing poles, all the cats would follow us because we caught fish and we'd throw them up there for the, for the, the, the cats to eat. So they'd all follow us on the beach, down to the beach. For some reason, when I took my surfboard to the beach, Stupid would follow me. And I think Stupid must have thought the surfboard was some kind of a fishing pole. But at any rate, after a while, I just got this crazy idea to take Stupid out in the water with me. So I put him on board, paddled out with him. Stupid did not like water, okay? Uh, after, after Stupid, I tried to teach some other cats how to surf, and I put him on a surfboard, and all he would do is jump off in the water and swim to the beach. And Stupid stayed on the board. So I, I went out there. Turned around and stupid would go to the very nose of the board because it was closest to the beach. And when I catch a wave and the water would start splashing over the nose, he'd back up. And the board would plane out, he'd run back to the front. And he did this all the way to the beach. So I thought I'd make him his own surfboard. So I made him a little surfboard, a signature model about this big. And I'd put him out there in the wave. And when a wave would come, I'd kind of push him into it. When the, when, the, when, the, when the board would start going down the wave, like you see in the top picture, and that water would splash up, He'd back up to the back of the board. When the when the board planed out, he'd run back to the front. And he, did, he did that the whole way in. So he kind of kind of learned how to surf. So what happened? How these pictures came about is uh, one day my sister told my mom, "Hey, stupid's out there surfing." My mom was a real publicity hound. Uh, she had the local uh, uh, friend of hers who was a newspaper reporter for the Orlando Sentinel came down 
He's going to film. He's got these expensive cameras. He takes his shoes off, his socks on. He rolls his pants up to about his knees. And he starts to wade in the water. And I turn around. Next thing I know, he's up to his waist. All his clothes, <laughs> taking a picture. But at any rate, it got into the Orlando Sentinel. And then somehow it found its way to the Chicago Tribune, which was our hometown. And then it found its way into Look Magazine. And then it found its way into a children's book of unique animals. And then it found its way to Surfing Magazine and got a whole page spread in the back. And this picture here actually came from the National Enquirer. This was a decade later that this picture showed up. Okay? So back then there were two TV shows. One was called uh, That's Incredible and, uh, and Real People were the two TV shows. We got calls from both of them wanting to come down and do a segment on Stupid. But unfortunately, stupid had uh, long passed that had gone to that great golden litter box in the sky. So, but at any rate, uh, stupid took on his life, a life of his own. Uh, some lady in Chicago knitted him a pair of monogram baggies with a whole his tail. The car, the Mustang you see there, when Cape Canaveral Motors opened, they had a contest uh, put your name in to win a new Mustang. That was the Mustang, my mom. <laughs> it was a little kitty car, and it was paint, it was white, but I painted it red to match stupid surfboard, and I put a little uh, platform on the floor where stupid could stand on it and actually drive the car. And the photographer did some video footage of stupid driving the car with his uh, with his surfboard in it. So he was a pretty cool cat back then. But enough about me. Now we're going to talk about Bob Freeman. So Bob, I'll let you talk about what happened in your first two years here. What, what you got up here? Bob, uh, typically, uh, he, he was, uh, uh, his first surf, surf sections were at Canaveral Pier here, inside Canaveral Harbor, Shark Pit, Patrick Pier, boating out seven miles offshore to surf the southeast shoal off Cape Canaveral and placing third in his first uh, surf contest at Canaveral Pier. You want to talk to you about that? Okay. Okay. I'm kind of soft-spoken. Can everyone <laughs> hear me okay? I don't even know if this is working. Yeah. I might be a little bit closer to here. Can y'all hear me in the back? Hello? I'll talk to you. I'll talk. I'll talk. Oh. That's different. Hello? It's not as loud. Is that better? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, okay, well, I learned how to surf in North Carolina on the Outer Banks and uh, grew up in a uh, little south face of the beach there off of uh, Cape, Ave, Cape Lookout and shadow for Banks. Uh, finished high school in 66, had an offer to come to Florida and work at the Space Center as an intern, and I uh, learned how to surf. So, you know, uh, off on my own, I just turned 18 and uh, moved down to Florida. And, um, I don't know what you can see, but it's the old, the old Canaveral Pier before it was all built up. It was all open deck and cars could drive up there. We had car and band shows back in the day and bands would play up there. Paul Revere and the Raiders and the Kinks and some others all came and played. <coughs> and uh, I first lived down by, uh, any of you surfers know where Cherry Down Park is in Cape Canaveral. I lived there. And so my first surf day, I walked from there all the way to the pier, carrying uh, my surfboard on my head. And um, I'd never surfed with more than a handful of people on the outer banks. And I finally uh, come to the pier and surf, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 surfers out. Very crowded lineup, and they were all very good surfers. And, uh, and I had learned how to surf, but I wasn't a good, a good surfer at that time. But um, when I, First job I had was at the Mouse Trap. Some of you timers might remember the Polaris Motel, the Mouse Trap Lounge. This is the watering hole for all the space folks, the engineers, and the astronauts. And I worked there and got a job across the street at Food Fair. And um, got hired here by North American Aviation at the time, which later became Rockwell. And, uh, and I uh, was, uh, launched Apollo rockets and was on the launch team for four years until they laid off. But that was the beginnings for me, uh, surfing here in Cocoa Beach. You see it's not very well developed, but uh, those were fun times. Um, back then, we all rode the same kind of surfboard. Those were all the surfboards you see in the old surf movies, big, heavy, uh, what we call longboards, uh, nine foot plus range. Uh, I had a 9.6 Hanson that I brought down from North Carolina uh, that I was riding at the time. 
Carbines articles here. Oh, uh, uh, handsome dude in there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, these are some. These, these are back when surfers had a way of settling differences in water, and uh, I'm still carrying a black eye here. <laughs> uh, some little, uh, little slap fest I had with a couple of the boys on a crowded day at the pier. Uh, the, the thing is, back then, we had the surfer tussles on the beach, and of course, we're all like 19 years old, quite full of ourselves. And, um, and you go and wind up on the beach and pop each other around a little bit, and, but when it was over, it was over. Uh, you know, I remember, oh, you got me right there, and oh, you got me right there, and paddle back out and surf again. Uh, so um, I encouraged my boys as they were growing up, I said, things have changed. So don't, don't get any tussles with anybody. It's not like it was back then when we could leave on the beach. But I uh, uh, had uh, surfed in a, a big contest. They used to have a big contest then on the 4th of July also. And I did well in that contest, and Florida today just did a, a story on that because uh, you know, I had uh, my firstborn at the time and uh, was working for myself and surfing when I could. But uh, for some reason, they liked the story. I uh, they were considering me an old veteran you know, back then. I think I was like 27 years old. But there weren't many older surfers, and also Jim and I were talking about this a lot. There also weren't many kids surfing because the boards were so heavy. So big then, you know, things changed. But uh, I, I got best overall in that contest, and uh, a lot of big names were in it. So that was that was pretty cool for me. So, uh, oh, and Jim asked if I could bring uh, a print out of the story, so I, I brought that for you guys. To see. So here's a picture of him at Canaveral Jennings in '67. Canaveral Pier. Bob told me he got up close and personal with a couple of those pilots. <laughs> Yeah. Sebastian, and look at that form, man. Yeah. Up with each pier. Wow. I mean, he's cranking. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to show a video here. Uh, I actually had this in there in the event we couldn't get the video to play, but we'll get the video to play here, so we will uh, let it play here. <laughs> Yes, sir. 
established an annual $1,000 surfing scholarship designed for students who enjoy surfing. Uh,